Okay, today I want to share from Psalm 32.8, I want to start with. It says this, I will instruct you and I'll teach you in the way you should go. But, there's always something in there that's a but, isn't there? But, do not be like a horse or a mule, needs to be harnessed, doesn't listen, it just needs to be harnessed before you can approach it and go near it. So what's he saying to us there? He will instruct us and teach us if we're open to his ways. Now that's a promise from the Lord that he will instruct us and he will teach us in the way he'll lead us. So we need to recognise what God has put in us. So he put giftings, abilities and desires and a destiny uniquely yours. Do you know you're a unique ability inside of you that God placed in there? So how do we have to ask this, how do I find that destiny? My granddaughter's usually on my case and in my face. How do I know my destiny? It was prophesied over her when she was in Jodie's womb. And she says, what did he say? What is my destiny? Well, I'm like, be patient, <laughs> be patient. It's coming, <laughs> it's coming. So uh, most people are like that, and it's all right. I'm not paying out on you, love. But we all want to know where we're going and what's special. Once we get saved, we want to know how do we fit and what is our part in the kingdom? What's our destiny? What am I supposed to be doing? What is it, Lord? But there is such a process. Ephesians said we grow in every aspect to full maturity. And so we, there's a growing process to happen in our life. See, do you ever feel like you're boxed in, that you can't, can't even feel like you're growing or you're not reaching anything? like a box around your life and we're not sure or unable to reach that potential that he's got in there. We know that it's in the word, we know he's given it to us, but it doesn't seem to work for you. It's like clothes that don't fit. You know, we've got our fat and our skinny clothes and we hang on to those skinny ones for the day we're going to get thinner in the hope that we'll get slimmer. One day I'll go to Weight Watchers or I'll do something and those clothes will fit me. And you try them on and it's like, ah, oh, they're uncomfortable, I haven't lost weight. And you just sort of hang on to them in the hope they're still going to fit you. But they don't fit and that's the whole thing. And so that's what we've got to do. Things just go on in our life, we never get over them. It's like, get rid of them, throw them out, put them aside and start again. There's always the shops to go and get new stuff. When you get thinner, <laughs> that good, shopping, <laughs> ladies say amen to that. The men go, oh no, what's she preaching for? <laughs> but there's things we never get over sometimes, we hang on to, like the death of a partner or a child, divorce, sickness, accidents, financial loss. These are just a few, job loss. There's hereditary things, things that we've seen there's vows we make, I will never forgive that person. I just never got over that. And they stick with us. They're inside of us and they're the things that hang in there and that what they do, they're a stronghold in our life. And if they form, there's a stronghold inside of us and it's, it's going to hold us back. Now, I heard a great man speak, and a lot of you would know Dr. Robbie Sondricker. He's a, a Christian psychologist, is he? psychologist here on the coast but he was sharing one day and he was talking about this he said he was talking on neuroplasticity he said the brain has an ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural patterns connections through life medical science is finding stagnant areas of the brain are able to be restored that's amazing isn't it because it was always put them aside put them in a you know, crazy home or something like that. But they can be restored because they can form new uh, neural connections. And I thought that was amazing. When he said that, and the girl beside me, she gave me a dig and she said, that's just like prayer counselling. In the emotional realm, you can get healed. You don't have to stay stagnant. See, that brain can be stagnant when they're put aside like that years ago and they just deteriorate more and more and nobody can do anything for them. And it's like the emotions, oh, you've got to live with that, oh, whatever. No, you haven't. Because if there's a stronghold that's in there, it has to come out. 
It can be healed. Those emotions are the same that can be healed and taken out of you so that you become whole. And it is a process. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, Lay aside the weights that easily beset us. Then you'll run the race, looking under Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, if you're looking under Jesus for your destiny and you're not finding it, what's wrong on the inside? And I don't advocate going navel-gazing, like, what's wrong with me, what is it? We're looking down all the time thinking there's a problem. Don't go digging. Rather, say, Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. See, the Bible says, as I commit my ways to him, my thoughts will be established. And so as I commit to him and say, there's a problem in there holding me back, Lord, what is it? He's going to give it to you. The Holy Spirit will reveal it without you going digging. Because I, you know, we can just get so focused, looking down, oh, woe is me, and I've got more problems. But it says we must return to the stronghold and cut it off. Zechariah, Zephaniah, no, sorry, Zechariah 9.12 tells us to return to the stronghold and cut it off. So if you ask the Holy Spirit where that is, where did it start, what's the root cause of it, it's like a spider in a web. You can clean cobwebs down, a few days later they're back. Clean it down again, they're back. You kill that spider, it, there's no more webs can be formed. And so that's like the root cause inside of us or the stronghold. We must get to that stronghold or the root cause of that thing. Sometimes it can be childhood, it can be in there, it can be hereditary, it can be anything. Because, you know, many times we've heard the saying, oh, yes, my mother was just like that. Oh, my grandma had that too. Oh, I'll just have the same. Well, that's rubbish. When you're saved, that's garbage. Throw it out. Get healed of it. It's a stronghold in your life. Today I'm hitting strongholds. I expect today for people to start to understand what is holding them back so they can move on in God because a stronghold is a hindrance in our Christian walk. Kill the spider. Get rid of the thing. It's a danger. It might bite you. <laughs> so what speaks loudest in your life? What, what area? What, what's the stronghold that speaks loudest in your life? See, in mine it was rejection. I was adopted as a baby. I was adopted out and I wasn't, um, well, I was given out, but then I wasn't adopted till six weeks. So a lot of people have heard this story about me, but I'm sure you'll forgive me if I share it again because I think it's relevant. So I grew up in life hating myself, realising that I was worthless, I was full of rejection, I didn't love me and I didn't think anyone else could ever love me. I just hated myself. I wanted to suicide. I was just useless. Nobody cared about me. Where did I come from? And I'd get mad with God. I'd go, why was I born? They were just a pair of kids messing up probably in the back seat of a car. Why did I have to come along? How can I believe, because I was saved by now, how can I believe that there's a gifting and there's a destiny for me, that you ordained my life, Lord? How can I believe that? No, that's, that's just wrong. And I don't think you're fair to allow me to even be born, Lord. And that's how I really felt on the inside. Well, it was totally wrong thinking, <laughs> and it came out of the hurt and the rejection. And it was one day, oh, I had two children by then, and we'd started in ministry, and I was battling through and trying to do the right thing, asking for counselling, and people were going, well, just forgive, and no, you're right, you're accepted in the beloved, you're loved, and um, just pray for people, just pray for those ones that gave you away, and, you know, just believe God. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm doing all that. <laughs> it's like, goodness me. Um, and it was, anyway, you just push on. And I was pushing on, doing all the right things, and we were in a seminar, and this man was teaching on body, soul and spirit and, and how the church had neglected the soul area for many years and they cared more about the body and the spirit man. Say your prayers, read the Bible, go to church, be good and when you're sick, go out and get anointed with oil and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. But what about the soul? Because God gave you emotions. And what about the soul? It was forgotten, it was neglected. So he was teaching on this and all of a sudden, oh, I started to cry. And I was just like, this is embarrassing, this man's teaching. And I'm shaking away, but I was starting to see something that had happened to me. And um, 
I had this problem over my name because if I now, now I'd found out that I had another name. I was Margaret Mary for six weeks. And so I was like, well, how can I even go up to the pearly gates to old Pete and go, when he says his name, please? <laughs> what do I say? I've got four names. <laughs> what do I say? Silly, isn't it? But that was coming from the aspect of the small person on the inside of me. And you know, you think as that, when you're locked in a stronghold, you, you're locked into that age, that area of your life. And so I was coming from that, I've come to understand this, from that little child perspective that as a child, I was trying to get up to those pearly gates and I didn't know how he'd let me in. What's my name? And this is going through my head and this man's still teaching. Then he said, we're going to stop. We're going to have a break. Let's just stand up and praise the Lord. And so we did that. And as I did, oh, the waterworks really broke. But he walked over to me and he laid hands on my head and he said, God knows you by your name. Your name is written down in glory. And you have a new name, it's written on a white stone. I'm like, wow, wow. Nobody knew how I was feeling. I hadn't told anyone. And I didn't fully understand it myself. But, you know, suddenly that feeling just went off me like that, all the tears, and the words, my soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler, just dropped into my... I was like, I'm free. I'm free. Who cares what name I am? Who cares? See, my mother had called me Esther Nance, but called me Nance. So that was the other quandary. I was like, well, why didn't you call me Esther if you liked Esther? Well, why didn't you call me Nance Esther? Because wherever I go, they call me by the wrong name. My name's Nance. You've called me Nance. And this, as well as the Margaret Mary thing, had me in knots over it. Because inside of me, I still didn't feel like I should have been born. I, I felt like under the law, you know, it was just like, had me tied up. And so hopelessness and depression had been around me. And so it's been a walk and it's been a gradual walk. I got so healed after that. It was a different thing. And I said to God, well, okay, okay, why give me something to hang on to? And he pointed me to Psalm 139. And you can read it yourself. It's too long for now. But it, it talks about he knew you in the dark parts of your mother's womb when your members weren't even joined together. In other words, I was that blob inside, that little dot. And he knew me. And I went, you knew me? But they were doing wrong. <laughs> you knew me? And he said, I owned you. I, and he, he breathed the breath of life. I knew you. And I went, wow, that was the biggest revelation I'd ever had. He knew me and he knew you. He's the giver of life. He breathed life into egg and sperm. He breathed life into your mother's womb. Not one person is a mistake. Not one person. He breathed life into that mother's womb. And I went, you know, you've seen an opportunity, God, and you put destiny and gift things, but hey, you own me. Who cares who my adoptive parents were, which was my big thing. Who are they? What's their name? What da -da? All those things. See, you've got to own something. When you're full of rejection, you feel like you've got to own something on the inside. And we all deserve that right. And I didn't own anything. Oh, sure, I had a new name that was given to me when I was adopted at six weeks. But that new name. So I, didn't, I wanted to own something. And there it was. He, I belong to God. He breathed life into me. Father God. He used two vehicles for the sake of my birthing. He used two vehicles for the sake of your birthing. So when it comes to then, you don't have to inherit all the hereditary junk that mum and dad went through. You can love them. You love them for what they've done and good parents or bad. You love them. But you don't have to inherit this stuff. He used them for the sake of your birthing. And you came forth with new giftings and new desires. See, we're all unique. My family, there can be similarities, similarities, but we're all unique. We're all different. There's a difference in us. And that's the beauty of God. What he's done is so unique in forming you and I. It's so amazing. So when we get all depressed and harassed, we look at others and go, they're getting through. They're surviving. They're doing well. Listen to the testimonies. I haven't got that testimony. I'm not doing well. Look at me. 
Well, where's my destiny and where am I going? But all of a sudden, you go, how can I get through this and not worry about that? He says there's a way through and it's 1 Corinthians 2.9. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things that God has laid up for you, but will be revealed by his spirit. See, it's all about his spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. What the Spirit can reveal to you. So the Holy Spirit, I dig into you and I go, okay, okay, I put my destiny in your hands and I'm just going to walk forward and I'm just going day to day and Lord, you're going to take me through and that's my destiny. It's a path that I walk that he'll fulfill. Don't go looking for things, but rather walk the path, walk the walk and know that his spirit's going to lead, lead you. And by his spirit, he's going to reveal, I hasn't seen, he hasn't heard, neither has it ended in the heart of man, the things that he has laid up for you. And he's revealed them by his spirit. Down further in verse 16, we have the mind of Christ. There's a scripture I really want to share with you, and it's in Isaiah. Isaiah 45, God lifts this up to me. For those that are feeling like it's a never-ending tunnel that you go through, I think of those guys in that um, mine in Tasmania, how they must have felt for days in that darkness and how bad it would have been. But it's like a lot of us when we're going through some tormenting things because the devil is a tormentor. I think of um, you know the torment that the devil puts on so many Christians and we get so tormented and we feel like we're locked in a tunnel or a pit and there's no light at the end of that tunnel. But he says this, and I feel like this is a scripture for anyone that's feeling like that. He says, I'll subdue nations before him. He says, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. Well, that's to us, to the anointed one. To subdue nations before him, to loose the armour of kings, and to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. The doors and the gates are speaking of various things that come and block us. I'll break in pieces the gates of bronze, and I'll cut the bars of iron. See, sometimes you feel like there's iron bars around you, you're in a prison, and you can't get out of that prison. Ever felt like that? I know I have, that it's a prison. So there's bars of iron. And he says this, I love it. He will, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that you might know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. So when you're in the darkness, when you're in that pit, he said there's treasures there that you can gather up, that you can bring forth. They're treasures for you, but they're also treasures. Who knows what a treasure chest is like? You can dig in it. I know when we started with the Christian Outreach Centre, we started in the children's work, and so we had a lot of fun for the kids, and we had a treasure box. Now, the kids thought it was amazing. Hazel and David were there with us. The kids thought it was amazing to come out to that little treasure box and ha get a pick out of it if they got their memory verse right or whatever. Now, there might have only been a pencil or a rubber or some little lolly, any little thing, but they thought they were made to get a pick out of that treasure chest. And it was such a big thing to them. They loved it. And so they dig in there, what do I want? And they dig, dig, dig around. Treasure. And you know, we can be like that in God. There's treasures. This book is full of treasures, hidden secrets that are in there. And while we're in the pit, if we'll hang into him and press into his spirit, he'll reveal those. He'll give us those secret riches that he says there, the secret riches that you can hand out. Oh, there it is up there. In secret places, you might know that I'm the Lord who call you by name. And then you can hand them out to others. I know trials that we've been through, um, some difficult things. I know when God said, go to America, take over the church. It was our mother church. Was that easy? We got rid of everything here, sold up everything, left our family, and we went over. Now, Neil was the international president, and that was our mother church of America, so he still had to run the movement worldwide as well. And uh, it wasn't that easy. It was pretty scary. 
But you know, God was with us and you push through and you do it. Well then, we're only there a few months and I broke my back. Being smart, tomogging and uh, being all silly. And they told me I'd be lucky if I ever walked again, but hey, I'm a miracle walking. They uh, put a rod in my back, um, which I had removed last year. Um, so I'm still getting straighter and stronger from getting it removed. But it's 11 years ago now and the recovery. There's lots of things happen in our life. You know, it was like a deterrent against us being there and traveling around the rest of the world. So I was locked into home for quite a bit, but I was there for the church. And that was very interesting. God, God just shows you things through times like that, but we've got to keep pressing into him, plugged into him, that we're able to push through. And we had a, a, we've had lots of issues to face. Our son, um, we lost our son 20 years ago, and he'd been sick most of his life and uh, recovered through many awful things. Um, and 20 years ago, he had a simple, minor operation and the anaesthetic took him out. And it was hard to face that because we'd faced many difficult things with him through life. But then the simple thing, we were so shocked and it took us by surprise. Well, we were running the movement worldwide and we had a conference to run within about two weeks after that. And we had to go to South Africa, not South Africa, where did we go? Fiji. We go over to Fiji to um, <laughs> to look after the move to preach there at a conference. And the first day, the national chairman had a, a what do they call them, Lovo, hungy thing for us, celebrated with all the leaders from all around Fiji, and um, it was wonderful. Well, we got to bed after that, and about two or three in the morning, we had this big knock on the door, panic knock, quick, come quick, he's died. <laughs> international president died. I mean, the national president died. We were the international. Come to the morgue and raise him from the dead. Well, was that a stretch? Our own son had died a few weeks back. <laughs> we couldn't raise him from the dead. It's like God and everybody was praying for him too. It's like, yeah, you get some big ass and some big tunnels. It's like, oh my goodness, this is a difficult one. But you do it and you walk through it and you wonder afterwards, how did I do it? Even as I'm telling you now, I'm thinking, how did we do that? How did we do it? Then we had to come back to Australia and run a conference to train pastors for the whole month. And that was interesting. We shed a few tears throughout the time. And people were lovely and prayed for us, but we did it. See, you've got to push through. There's difficult times. There's hard times. Things we don't understand in God, and we say, but why God? Why did that happen? That shouldn't have been. And I know that many of us and many of you have faced difficult times. But hey, do it anyway. Live your life and do it anyway. Walk through it. Kick the box. Kick those boxes that you feel you're bound in. You're bound in sickness or you're bound in a, a death that you can't get over or you're bound in a hurt that's happened in your life. Kick out of the box. Get out of it and run for it. Run for it. Do what you've got to do. There's treasures in that dark pit. But there's joys that can come out too, out of that. It's not all hardship. See, there's abundant living. There's joy, wisdom, favour and wealth. See, I've found so much joy. I said to the Lord, okay, I'm not getting any help with counselling. People are all telling me to just love that person or just forgive that person or just do this or that. And it's not working. There's got to be another way. And that's when I had a fuller revelation of the body, soul and spirit. And so I asked him for a scripture. And he gave me the scripture in um, Zechariah. And I followed through on that and I developed a whole teaching. And I believe Holy Spirit led. And I prayed for many, many people and I've taught it the world over. I would literally have seen thousands of people set free in emotional areas strongholds that were in their life and had been there for a long time and all they had to say was we called on the Holy Spirit see it wasn't me because I said God I'm not skilled I only know what you Holy Spirit can show me and I went with that knowledge when I taught any of it or prayed for anybody and because you can get into a lot of trouble by professing or having a word of knowledge over somebody um, that isn't of God 
Sometimes I've had to pray for people to break off strongholds where people have said words over them, thinking it's God, and it hasn't been, and it's affected their life. And so I've always said to anyone I've trained in counselling, do not use word of knowledge. When you're counselling, ask the Holy Spirit to show that other person what it is and let him reveal it to them, and then it'll lift off them because that means they're ready to deal with it. See, we've got to be at a ready place to deal with something or we just hang on to it. And it's like the iceberg, we just push it down a bit further. See, it's like our conscious and subconscious, a third's above the water, two thirds is down here. So consciously we remember a third of things, two thirds we push down and we think we're never going to remember them, hurts, push them down the bottom, I'll never think of that again. But hey, all of a sudden it'll go, oh, you know, where did that come from? Why am I thinking of that? It's because it's down there and it never goes away. And that's the stronghold or the spider that you have to kill. You've got to kill that thing so that it's gone from your life altogether. It never erases that it happened, but it erases the hurt, the pain, and you're able to shed forgiveness to that person. See, many people live in unforgiveness by those vows. I will never forgive. I never got over that. You've got to get over it. Get over it in God. You've got to forgive. You've got to put the past behind you. See, you cannot change the past, but you can change your future by walking into your destiny and saying, Holy Spirit, lead me. I want to go forward and I want to be the person you created me to be, not the person that I've been made by school teachers or people doing things over me that weren't good or hereditary stuff. I'm throwing it all off and I want to walk in you, God. I want the destiny that you prescribed for me. See, he's the master physician. You prescribed the destiny for me, Lord, and that's the one I want. And that's the one I'm determined to walk in. I'm not going to get round like a sad sack and live in the past. I want to alter my future by walking ahead and dealing with some of these things and getting them off. Now, just a, a few uh, beautiful examples. One was Moses. We all know the story of Moses and how he was brought up in Pharaoh's house. Well, how hard would that have been? But what did he end up doing? All the amazing things. And today, for time, and also you've heard it all preached and you would all know what it's all about. Then there's Esther. Esther in um, Esther 4.13. Imagine the fear of fronting up to the king. She could have been killed. But instead of that, she set a whole country free. She was born for such a time as this. Are you born for such a time as this? To come forward in God and just do excellent triumphs in his name. Then there's Joseph, beautiful Joseph. He suffered, I love Joseph and the story of Joseph. He suffered so much, his family ridiculed him for the dreams that he had. They put him aside. The brothers wanted him killed. Get him out of here. But hey, what happened? What happened to him? He ended up going into Pharaoh's house. He ended up in prison. He ended up getting accused wrongly. But in the midst of that, his dreams came to Pharaoh and he interpreted them. And he saved, the next thing, he's too IC to Pharaoh. But I look at his life, there was no malice, no anger. He just found treasures down in the pit. And he was thrown in the pit. He found treasures and he held on to them and he kept the right attitude and he pressed into God. He never gave up on God. And then all this happened where he was exalted to the two I see in that nation. And then he was the one that saved his whole family, including his brothers. The dream came true where they bowed down to him because they were in famine and they came in and they bowed down to him <laughs> and got food and their lives were saved. And he revealed himself after that. But he, you know, he forgave them. See, the keys are all there. You read his life. There's keys there, no malice, no anger, all forgiveness. He forgave, and so God exalted him in due season. It's all about due season. So if we walk through and we kick all those boxes, we break through, we throw ourselves on God, we're more dependent on the Holy Spirit, then we become more, more understanding in ourselves and more compassionate to other people's frailties. 
See, the Bible tells us, to, uh, that God wants us to look through the eye of the Spirit. Not, he says, judge not that you be not judged. But how often do we look at somebody and start judging them? How often do we, are we accused of doing that? How many people have done it to you? But he says, don't. Look through the eye of the Spirit. That's Holy Spirit. What is it with that person? What's, I, do they just need hugging? Do they just need loving? What do you need me to do? And love them, pray for them. And be an opportunist. I'm an opportunist. If I see something like that, I jump in to help and to grab that person and break that stronghold over their life. So your victories will speak louder than your giftings. Do you know that? They'll speak louder than your giftings. I think of the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. Both were fed by the Jordan River, but the Sea of Galilee had an input and an output. So fish lived in it. The Dead Sea was just dead. Now I've been to the Dead Sea. <laughs> you can't sink. <laughs> that, and it stinks. <laughs> dead is dead. It stinks. We went on a tour of Israel in it with a whole group and we got out there and I was like, oh, who bought eggs? They're rotten. Rotten eggs I can smell. <laughs> That's what it smelt like. I was like, oh my goodness. But it was the Dead Sea, <laughs> the odour, the sulphur coming out of it. But you see, the Sea of Galilee is so different. Fish live in it and there's a flow in and a flow out. And that's got to be your life. Don't be dead on the inside. Have that inflow, let the Holy Spirit come in and let him flow through you and hand out the treasures so that you've got the inflow and the outflow, that you can help others in the time of need. And many people would have gone through the things you've gone through. Well, many times they're difficult and you think, why have I got to go through this? But, you know, you grow and you learn so much out of it and you are helped other people. And that's what God wants us to be. He's commissioned us to be out there and help the needy. And you and I need to have our hearts pure to do that. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. But it's to be used of God is my desire. See, that's got to be our prayer. To be used of God is my desire. See, our hearts need to be open to God because he looks at the heart. He sees desires and he sees needs and he sees hurts. So be transparent. Come to the Holy Spirit and be transparent. Don't, <laughs> don't wear a mask. Gee, we're good at putting masks on, aren't we? So people don't really know us or really see who we really are. We put the mask on and we're, oh, we're great. Yeah, we're great. Yeah, that's great. We don't go around moaning about our things, but we need to put on the whole armour of God, smile, press into the Holy Spirit, have the joy of the Lord around you and start to have the inflow and the outflow coming out. Allow the treasures, the secret riches that are down the bottom. I'm sure those kids when they were digging, they thought if they dig deep enough, they'd get better things than what were on top. And they dig and dig and dig. And, Come on, hurry up. Someone else needs to get into that treasure chest. But they would dig and dig. But there's secret riches if we dig in. And that's the word of God. Dig deep into the word of God so that you've got the secret riches that you need to hand out to other people. That's what we need today. We've been hearing so much preaching lately on what's coming and the move of God we're expecting that's about to break open. So we need to allow the growth in these areas, allow ourselves to come forward and just be used of God, to be used of God, allow the treasures to come out, the secret riches, so that you can be different. When these people come in that we believe are coming in, we're going to be on our toes, I can tell you that. We're going to be on our toes. So today, today I just want to share with you, and I want to be able to pray for some people that might need breaking out of boxes to allow their treasures to unfold today. If you've got some of those hurts that are stagnant inside of you, just think about it. If God is touching an area of your life, I don't want to know about it. The simplicity is when the Holy Spirit knows about it, you don't have to tell it all. It's not a confessional. You don't have to tell all. you just got to lift up that area. If he's touching a root area or a spider is being revealed, he wants to break it off you. And I'll just be agreeing with you by the anointing. Okay? 